as you might know, the uh, importance of locally rare plants um, has, has been increasingly recognized and appreciated lately over about the last 15 years or so. Um, and the East Bay chapter of CMPS, um, which covers um, Contra Costa and Alameda counties on the east side of San Francisco Bay, we were one of the first chapters to start looking at our local plants in terms of local rarity. Um, and it came about in the late 1980s. Um, at that time, our rare plant committee was doing uh, rare plant surveys every Sunday year round. Um, and there was sort of a core group of us. And we were noticing that there were certain plants, that, uh, certain native plants, that we saw like all the time, some not so much, and some almost never. We thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So um, almost for a lark, uh, we decided to make a list of all the plants that had five locations or less in our two counties. Um, so we started reviewing the uh, plant list that we had for the surveys, and then we did our, our um, all of our own field notes and plant lists we you know, made over the years. And then we really went to town. We just uh, reviewed every plant list every resource we could probably possibly get our hands on. Um, we uh, got all the plant lists from um, the park district. Uh, there had been a few uh, dissertations that had been done in our area, various uh, parts of our area. Uh, looked at herbarium vouchers, um, talked to a whole bunch of botanists, and we, we were very thorough. And we thought we would come up with a list of about 50 plants. Well, we came up with 800 and 61 plants. <laughs> These were plants that had five locations or less in our two counties. And we were like, whoa, you know, and we were blown away. Um, and so, of course, with this many plants at risk, we thought, well, we gotta get the word out to agencies and everybody else, because after all, they would fall under CEQA regulations. There are actually two sections in CEQA that deal with locally rare species. Um, but how exactly do you go to an agency and say, oh, here's 861 more plants you have to worry about. <laughs> yeah. And that's in addition to 93 statewide rare plants that were already known in the two counties. So we decided we had to do something to make this list a little bit more manageable, a little bit more meaningful, um, so it could actually be useful to people. Um, so we started thinking, OK, uh, are all these plants really equally endangered here? I mean, after you, all, you've got some really small populations, you've got some really large populations, um, and uh, some of these plants are, are a lot more common in the rest of the state, some are not. Uh, and so there's a lot of factors involved. And so um, we came up with this uh, system of, um, let's see if I can do this. Okay, we came up with this uh, ranking criteria system. And our, uh, our original ranks um, were A, B, C, and Q. And A was plants with two locations or less in our area, or meeting other qualifying criteria. B was three to five locations, or meeting other qualifying criteria. C were plants with five locations or more. We didn't have an end number, but that we still figured weren't really common. And then Q was, was our rumor list. These were plants. <laughs> Uh, somebody said, you know, they occurred somewhere, but nobody knew where, and, um, you know, we, we couldn't find the source. Uh, and that list was actually 165 plants. And now we've got it down to 14 plants. So over the last 26 years, which is how long we've been doing this, um, we, we have answered a lot of those questions. Um, also over the years, um, we came up, um, with a different um, ranking system. We, uh, well, actually, it was the same system, but it just got changed and refined a little. And you can see that um, A was divided into A1 and A2. So A is now two or more, or the other qualifying criteria, which I forgot to put on the slide. So it's criteria, very important. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, A2 became three to five locations uh, for the other qualifying criteria that had been our B. Uh, in 2001, we added A1X, which is presumed extirpated, and we've got 59 plants on that list right now. And then our Q list became A question mark. As I said, I think we've got 14 plants on that now. Uh, and uh, all of those A-ranked plants 
are subject to CEQA regulations. Um, and then our B and C rank plants, they actually form a two-tiered uh, watch list. So they are not currently really required to be looked at under CEQA, but they could get worse. <laughs> they could go up to an A. Um, and so B is uh, plants with six to nine locations, and C is plants with um, 10 to 15 locations. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, now here's our other qualifying criteria. We came up with eight at the very beginning. We had limited threatened habitat, range limit, disjunct, uh, fire followers, small populations, overlooked, narrow, uh, uh, small geographic range, narrow range in the East Bay, and then later, a couple years later, we added uh, declining and stressed, which should have been no brainer, but you know, it took us a couple years to realize those should be criteria too. Um, the first three criteria, which are uh, limited and uh, threatened habitats, range limits, and uh, disjunct, they uh, can also be accounted for by the fact that the East Bay is really a melting pot for California vegetation. Um, and you, you have, um, you have uh, plants coming down from the north that like the uh, sort of wetter, uh, cooler kind of uh, climates um, or conditions. And you've got plants coming up from the south that like the drier, warmer conditions. You've got coastal vegetation coming in from the left, and you've, uh, or from the west, <laughs> and um, valley and, and montane coming in from the east. And they all come together in the East Bay really a big melting pot. And so as a result, we have a lot of different habitats, a really great variety of habitats in the East Bay. And a lot of them are very limited. So naturally, a lot of the plants that occur in those habitats, especially the ones that are endemic to those habitats, are also very limited. So that accounts for a lot of things. And then also this melting pot effect uh, also accounts for the fact that we have um, 89 uh, taxa so that reach their, their uh, range limits here in the East Bay. And we also have 32 disjunct species. And then we have fire followers. Um, uh, next criterion. Uh, and this is a tough one because the plants move around um, a long time between fires and it's, it's sort of really hard to track their rarity. Um, excuse me. Um, and you have something like Eminanthe penduloflora, which started out on our A list, but over the years, we have found it showing up after a lot of fires in a lot of places, um, and sometimes in great profusion. The bottom picture there shows it at Monteagua two years ago after the uh, 2013 Morgan fire there. Uh, in 2014, this was late in the season, but this is what the Eminanthe looked like. You can see it. In, absolute carpet, and we have a lot of, um, you know, it, it covered a lot of the mountain. A lot of the mountain really looked like that, just covered. Um, so now Eminanthe has gone down to a B rank, and in our next review, I think it might actually go down to the C level. Um, so some things, you know, start out at the A level, but as we do more research, we find out more data, and so the ranks will change. Um, now, on the other end of the spectrum, You've got something like uh, Antirhinum cologii, which is on the right there. And that used to be known only from like one, um, one record of Mount Diablo, it was after a fire, and it was in 1940. And there have been several fires at Mount Diablo since then, but it never turned up again until uh, two years ago. Um, and he here is actually the one who found it. Um, and he was just telling me the other day during the second year, there are actually even more plants. Um, and it'll be interesting to sort of track it, see how long it lasts, see uh, if it disappears again, and um, when it reappears again. But in East Bay, Mount Diablo is the only place it is known from. Um, and then uh, another, uh, the, the next criterion is small populations. And this is a really, um, Another difficult one, but a very important one, because after all, uh, population with three plants, especially if it's an annual, um, or a population of 3,000 plants, 
there's a different at-risk level there. So you really want to know what population size is. And we always emphasize to our volunteers, make sure you get a count or at least the area that the population covers so we can track it from year to year and see how it's doing. <coughs> Um, but so many records do not have any population size data. You know, uh, you're very much just dealt with plant list dozen, of course. And we have put in a lot of um, field research over the years determining the population size of a lot of uh, records that we don't have population size for. So that's a, a, a really important one. And then the next criteria, whoops, sorry, um, getting ahead of myself. Uh, the next criterion is overlooked. And this is my favorite criterion, actually, because I love tiny plants. The tinier the better, um, especially if you look at it in lenses, it's really pretty. But nobody pays attention to small plants. They're just never reported. Um, and we actually started out with quite a few on our original list, and now we have like maybe three or four, because over the years, again, as we did field research, we kept finding more and more populations of these. And a lot of them don't even rate a C rank anymore. So um, you know, you have to look at all the plants, big, pretty ones and small, you know, insignificant ones. Uh, so that's another one. And then uh, you've got small geographical range. Um, there are a lot of plants that uh, are much more common in the rest of the state, and then you some of them aren't. And this was something that back in the 1990s I, I tried to pursue, um, and we still don't really know that much about it. But uh, in the mid-1990s, I sent a letter to all of the chapter, um, CMBS chapter, um, rare plant people. And uh, I asked them, well, what is the status of these plants in your area? And every single response I got was, we don't know. So that project kind of went nowhere. Um, but I like to think that maybe I sort of had something to do with planting a little seed uh, in some of our chapters to start looking at the locally rare plants on a locally rare basis. Because it was only within about five years or so that the locally rare, rare plant um, movement, or whatever you want to call it, sort of became more and more popular and grew. And, and now almost every chapter of CMPS across the state has a locally rare plant program. So I'd like to think I had a little bit to do with that. A little feather in my cap, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what's the next one? Um, narrow range in the East Bay. Um, we have uh, some plants that occur in a very small area, like maybe a 10 or 20 mile radius. And then you've got something that has the same amount of populations, but it's spread out all over the counties. So the, the ones that are clustered together are much more at risk because some pathogen or climate change or something comes, it's gonna wipe all of them out. Uh, whereas if some, you know, with the population spread out all over the place, uh, it's going to take those things a little bit longer to, to uh, those pathogens a little longer to get to them. Um, and then, um, <coughs> and as I said, we added declining and stress um, later, and those are kind of self-explanatory, I think, too. Uh, and it was just those eight were our original criteria. So once we sort of applied these ranks and criteria, we felt like we had a more manageable list. We, I think we also got the list down to 661 plants at that point. Still a lot, but you know, a little bit better. Um, and at least we could sort of put them in sections and categories. It wasn't like this big lump. Um, and so we were thinking, well, how do we get the word out? And by that time, we had set up a database. So we decided, let's organize it into a report and make it available to the public. So. Very dry today. Um, so in 1992, we came out with our first report, and it was called Unusual and Significant Plants about Mina Contra Costa Counties. And note that title. It was, it's not locally rare plants, it's unusual and significant plants. And that is because back then, nobody knew what the hell we were talking about when we said locally rare. Every time you mention it to someone, they said, oh yeah, statewide rare plants that occur locally. And you know, we have to explain it. So we came up with the term unusual, because that's exactly what they were. They were plants that were unusual in our two county area. And so um, uh, for 26 years, 
uh, the East Bay chapter has had an unusual plants program where most every other chapter that started their, their um, programs later, uh, they all had locally rare plant programs because by that time, the term was much more understood and accepted. Um, so, uh, anyway, this, uh, this, first, the, this first report that we put out, um, it was 52 pages long and it had two appendices. Now, over the years, we went on to produce eight more editions and you can see now we have the pretty cover. This is our, our latest one. And it's 192 pages long and it has 14 appendices. And it now costs $25, whereas our first one was cost $5. <laughs> um, now, uh, so, so we've uh, progressed quite a bit. Um, now, when we, first re uh, when we first put this report together, we notified a whole bunch of agencies that this report was available. And we um, emphasized three things in our letter. We uh, emphasized the importance of these plants, um, how they met CEQA regulations, and how they could help in land management and planning um, issues. Um, and the response was excellent. We were really surprised. The orders kept rolling in. A lot of them were, were coming from um, uh, land management and planning agencies, which was one of our main targets. Uh, so we were really happy. And we actually went into a third printing that year. So it was quite successful. Um, also, within a few years, a lot of our consultants, um, uh, consulting firms, were uh, including locally rare plants in their list of special status plants to, um, to, to survey for. And in addition to that, two of our largest land management um, agencies, which is the East Bay Regional Park District and the um, um, East Bay Municipal Utility District, they have both mapped all of their locally rare plants, they monitor them periodically, and they include them in all of their issues. So um, we've uh, really had you know, a pretty good success. Um, now over the years, we've continued our research. We've had as many as 40 individual volunteers out in the field at one time looking for um, and monitoring these plants. And um, we have refound actually a lot of historical populations. Um, and partly due, we've got about three or four people in our chapter that are mountain goats, basically. They get, into, they get into every nook and cranny, and they find all these things. And here's an example. Um, at, between the years of, uh, of 2001 and 2003, it's a two-year period, um, we refound 14 uh, species that have been ex um, presumed extirpated from our two counties. And you can see some of these, like those last three, they hadn't been reported or seen since um, the late 1800s. And our mountain goats found them. Um, so we've had some, some really good luck. Uh, now in addition to that, since 1992, um, 109 species have been found that were never known from Alameda and Contra Costa counties before that. Um, and, and those are naturally occurring populations. Planted populations don't count, only, only the um, natural ones. Um, so that was really cool too. Now over the years, we've also made some changes uh, in both the database and the report. And um, in the mid 90s, we went, um, we changed uh, over from a individual location system to a region system. We have 40 botanical regions, and here's what they look like applied to our two counties. And um, we did this because we were noticing that, um, uh, well, there are some areas that, that, that have been botanized really a lot, especially like around the universities and stuff, um, and others that have hardly, there's hardly any information on them. So by going to a region system, it really sort of gives you a better idea of what the real distribution or um, you know, in rarity or commonness is of a plant, um, and it uh, um, and there was something I forgot. Anyway, uh, a good example um, is truly a Movado. Now, in the um, in the old system, it would have been in B rank, which means it wouldn't have to be considered by CEQA. 
Um, and there are nine locations, but they're all within about a 10 mile, uh, or 20 mile radius of each other. So it's really sort of a more at risk level, uh, which is more indicative of its current rank. It occurs in five regions, and so it's got an A2 rank. So it's a little bit more indicative, really, of its um, at risk level. Um, now in 2010, we produced our last report, and our focus changed. We decided to come into the 21st century, and uh, we wanted to get the database online, into an online format, and um, have it available to the public, so they could basically make their own report, or they could search for specific data that they wanted. Um, and luckily, we had a, um, a, a very skilled and very good um, programmer, uh, Greg Weber, and he uh, did the transition very smoothly. Um, now, one problem that came up though was when you go from a one-user database to a multi-user database, there are certain problems that come up. So we had to make some changes, uh, we may have been making some improvements, and so it's been sort of slow going, but we're getting really close to the end now. And our plan is to uh, launch the database in March. So. Um, Keep an eye on our chapter website. There'll be a link where you can go to the database. And this is what a search page from it would look like. Um, you'll be able to search either um, for species records or observation records. And then there will be 36 categories under that you can uh, search for, which will be like rarity, uh, location, either region or specific location, um, habitat, um, all sorts of things. It'll be 36. Um, and then here is what the uh, result page will look like. Uh, this is for Papaver californicum, and um, which is one of our fire followers. And you'll notice there are three different colors of records. The blue, or purple, whatever you want to call it. Um, sorry about blue, it seems purple these days. Uh, anyway, it indicates historical record. And then the orange, uh, represents that there is something wrong with that record. Either we don't know the ID, we're uh, not sure, or, or you know, the ID hasn't been confirmed, uh, we aren't sure about the location, we aren't sure it's whether it's natural or, or um, planted, uh, and orange can also indicate that it was a negative survey on that day. We didn't find it there. Um, and so this is important to know because when, when we're determining a rank, um, it has to be a uh, current, a current population, a confirmed population, and a naturally occurring population. And those are all the white or clear records. And so that's a, a really important thing to know. Um, now, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was that, um, you know, this uh, report uh, became a very important conservation tool, not only for the agencies around, but also for our chapter's conservation committee. And um, one thing that we do with almost uh, every time we send out a comment letter, we include all the local rare plants and we explain how they are, um, uh, how they are covered by CEQA. Um, so that's one thing. And then uh, the other thing um, that the database has led to, um, uh, which I'm going to have Keith tell you more about, it's, um, uh, okay, let's see. Botanical Priority Protection Areas. Um, and it's a program he's been working on for, or a project, and it's a report he's put together. It's a great job, and I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you. All right, well, it's a pleasure to speak with Diane here. She's uh, definitely an unsung hero in the East Bay, and uh, nice to see her catch some limelight. So, um, she actually is, uh, personally responsible for about 5,000 observation records in the database, so um, she's done some work there. <laughs> so in 2010, um, our chapter published a guidebook uh, called the Guidebook to Bi uh, Botanical Priority Protection Areas of the East Bay, what we call PPAs. And what a PPA is, is a, uh, it's a rich uh, area of diversity for locally and statewide rare plants sensitive communities, unique substrates and climates, and uh, geographic regions uh, that represent the melting pot that uh, Diane had mentioned. 
Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know, due to the close proximity to urban centers, there's definitely a lot of threats to these places, um, as well as other factors. But the intention for identifying these PPAs was to inform local land managers and, and uh, decision makers that um, you know, we want to conserve the things we care about in the East Bay, uh, particularly in this case, locally rare plants. So um, these PPAs have become a crucial part in the playbook where the conservation uh, arm of our chapter directs conservation efforts. So um, thanks to our friends over at Stillwater Sciences, they put together this nice interactive Google map um, that's available to see on our website. And this map shows the 15 uh, PPAs that we have, and they're more or less um, sort of um, on the east side of the chapter area because that's where most of the intact habitat um, still remains. But just to go through a couple of them here, the top three of the most locally rare plants. Uh, we can start with the Delta um, PPA, which is uh, up here. And if you look at that magenta color, and all those other polygons, those represent significant substrates. And that magenta color is actually sand mounds, which is a particular habitat that we have that's very unique in the east part of Contra Costa County. And 50% of that habitat has been lost. Um, that's sort of what's, what it looks like, what's left. Then you go into Corral <coughs> Hollow here, which is uh, on the eastern side of Alameda County. And there's um, 64 locally rare plants known there. And this is sort of a the edge, the eastern edge of the county before it dips into the uh, Central Valley, so we have a lot of uh, peripheral populations there. There's a, there's a picture of uh, Corral Hollow. And then there's Cedar Mountain, which um, on these purple polygons shows a lot of um, undisturbed serpentine habitat, and we have 150 locally rare plants there. So um, that is definitely something worth conserving there, although there's not a whole lot of threat. Um, it's um, harbors a lot of diversity. So um, for the past 10 years, our chapter has been able to hire a conservation analyst um, who uh, it's all funded by member donations and it's a part-time job and the people in this position represent the front line in our conservation efforts. Um, and uh, through the establishment of the PPAs and um, the ability to hire a conservation analyst, we made significant success in protection of locally rare plants in the chapter. We're just gonna go through a couple examples uh, one of them is here in our Richmond Shoreline PPA, which includes Point Milani. And um, there was some development pressure from a casino back there a few years ago. And the conservation analyst there um, was able to um, fight off the um, casino with some other conservation partners. And um, mainly because Point Milani is more like Marin. It's the western part of our, our uh, county or our chapter. And um, it has a lot of coastal uh, coastal characteristics to it, but um, the development pressure uh, through our efforts, led by the conservation analyst, the casino, the casino was defeated, and Richmond actually added some language into the general plan uh, related to locally rare plants. There's a picture of point one. Um, a couple years ago, myself and uh, Conservation analyst Lech Namovich went and presented to the steering committee of the Eastern Alameda Conservation Strategy, which is um, a regional conservation planning tool, a way to streamline permitting and uh, provide guidance for species mitigation in Eastern Alameda County. Um, we presented to the steering committee and actually uh, on the PPAs, and they agreed to include them as um, conservation target areas for mitigation as part of that plan. So uh, there's a success for local river plants also. And then lastly, I just wanted to focus real quickly on, on Corral Hollow because uh, this is a very interesting area. And um, most recently, we've been, uh, local river plants have been used to argue the significance of Corral Hollow for refugia of local river plants there. And uh, it's currently threatened by um, off-highway vehicle expansion from a state park nearby. Um, so the flora of Corral Hollow is based in part on species migrations from desert climates, um, sort of an escalator effect coming up uh, from the western Mojave on the west side of San Joaquin. And uh, these migrations have resulted in many locally rare plants um, occupying Corral Hollow. And uh, based on previous studies, particularly by David Axelrod in the early 1980s, the onset of drier climates in the Holocene, uh, referred to sometimes as the hypsothermal, Influenced California flora between 8,000 and 5,000 years ago. 
and the rise, this rise in temperature enabled plant species to migrate, in this case northward from the desert, into Corral Hollow, and the subsequent cooling since then has left these migrants stranded in these relic sites for refugia. Um, so uh, there are climate change winters, people. Let's not forget about them. Um, and uh, since they're stranded there, um, they've reached their northern limits. And so um, the process creates strong natural selection there as a peripheral population for such species under the climatic stress that they experience, which could uh, result in new gene combinations, giving rise to some uh, new endemic species, narrow endemics potentially. And so 42% of the locally rare species in um, Corral Hollow actually include Mojave distributions. And 46% are at or very near the end of their northern distribution. So uh, just a couple quick stories to summarize why locally rare plants matter in the East Bay and why Diane's work um, has uh, been able to be used for conservation efforts. And uh, you know it's very, very important for biodiversity and, um, evolutionary changes as well as climate, uh, climate change perspectives, which we hear so much about these days. So um, uh, places like Rob Hollow are definitely indicative of that. And uh, just want to say that, you know, Diane mentioned that a lot of chapters have locally rare plant programs. Some don't. For those that don't, we really encourage um, them to be developed because they can be used for <coughs> conservation and that there is CEQA hooks for them to be able to use, uh, for you to use, um, to protect these plants in California. And, you know, we're lucky in the East Bay to have a champion like uh, Diane Lake that uh, we can uh, use as an example and uh, um, see as a conservation hero. vouchers of these, especially ones for new county records or things that haven't been found in 100 years? Well, some of the, some of the records are based on herbarium collections. So, um, you know, they were put into the database and that would be the last record of them found. And I would say that some of our uh, contributors are um, app collectors like David Gowen, for instance, um, and uh, myself, um, but I'm not sure if yeah, it also depends on the size of the population, too. If there's enough to really, if there's uh, enough plants to really make the berry vouchers, then, um, yeah, definitely, because it's really important to know. That, but sometimes, like, you, you know, if you want to keep plants, we don't, we will take pictures. <laughs> That's how the best. Yeah, I think the vast majority of the, of the uh, um, records in the database are definitely observational. My question has to do with access on private property, and did you have, I mean, we found that to be issues in mapping and, you know, verification of things, so how did you handle, I would assume a lot of that land is private property, so how did you handle that? Uh, there is a fair amount, <coughs> there is a fair amount that was private property, and a lot of um, our members know somebody, or uh, know somebody who knows somebody, so we've gotten permission that way. Um, and then there's just a lot of uh, properties we haven't been able to get onto. We, we certainly haven't researched or surveyed every single inch of the two counties. Yeah, we're fortunate in the East Bay, though, that we have over 300,000 acres of uh, preserved open space. Steve. Uh, Diane, can you, a uh, technical question, can you give me the two CEQA sections that you were talking about, or maybe you can? Um, I don't know the exact numbers of them. Um, but one talks about uh, species of local concern, and the other one talks about uh, natural resources that are unique or rare to a region. And I don't remember the numbers. If you go to the East Bay CNPS chapter website, you can yeah. find that on um, Diane's um, page for unusual plants. But I think one of them is 1538. And then 15125. <laughs> So this is a really interesting as a grassroots organization shaping policy on so many levels. I'm curious, like as a local organization, 
have you faced legal challenges and then had to serve as, you know, in court, proving right. these things. And then also for places where you suspect that there are probably locally rare species on private land, as a previous question approached, um, have you had the ability or the power to do the surveys for those plants to shape the outcome of whether development might occur or not? Sometimes we have, sometimes we haven't. Um, as I said, uh, we, we have um, some members who know people who know people, and so we have been able to get onto some places, some places along Mines Road, and uh, Cedar Mountain is another one. Um, so Greenhouse you knows the people who have the ranch there, um, and some other places. One of our members actually uh, owned them there at one time. So we've had some uh, things, but then others, uh, we just love to get up there. There's a place on Man Ridge, and it's all privately owned. Yeah, there are signs, you know, we shoot first, we ask questions later. So we haven't been able to get on there, but, uh, you know. Um, so I would say, too, that, uh, you know, during the CEQA process, the notice of preparation, you go for a scoping meeting or something, and the conservation analyst in the past has pre prepared a letter, a comment letter, saying that, we would like to see locally rare plants included in um, CEQA analysis, and sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. Um, there's been a couple of cases where it has stuck, and there is evaluations of um, potential impacts to those. But as far as uh, sitting on this expert witness that could potentially come uh, soon if uh, Corral Hollow goes um, in a way that we don't want to, um, which is probably likely to happen. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering when you made your list of criteria um, way back when, um, how come you didn't choose land use as one of those criteria? Um, I'm not sure. It never occurred to us. Um, uh, I guess it, it, we might have thought that it was covered under some other criteria. Um, good idea. As I said, it took us about two or three years to realize we should add declining and stress, which should have been obvious. Um, but yeah, land use would be a good one too. Because it, uh, it, land, land use changes, I mean, of course it's declining mm -hmm. in stress, but it could be that the land is being used properly and it's not always declining in stress in, underneath a certain type of land use. Right, yeah, and there are some things too that, that occur like, like uh, Mount Diablo, which is a state park, and so the plants are supposedly protected already, uh, or the East Bay Regional Parks too, where um, that, that was sort of taken into the, the uh, equation that if it was already uh, in a protected situation, you know, we might uh, not give it as much attention as something that was um, not in a protected situation. Right, but we know that recreational use is yeah. not necessarily <laughs> helpful. <laughs> yeah, there, there is, a, you know, but at least it's a, there's a little bit more hope for it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. How does vegetational succession factor into your analysis of, uh, of the, the, the rare plants? And are, are, they, are some areas threatened by change in vegetation? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's part of our, uh, of our stress category, too. If, if, um, like if there are weed or pathogen things that is making the vegetation uh, decline, that it's also covered by the declining. Something is declining, we try to look into why it's declining. Um, yeah, so, so there's a couple of things like that. Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that is uh, a good example of that is historical photos of the Berkeley Hills show the Berkeley Hills is completely grassland. And today, of course, there's been planting of a lot of uh, eucalyptus, but there's also been a lot of coyote brush coming in. And so records of old plant species that we don't see anymore um, uh, could be a result of um, coyote brush intrusion. So um, they're kind of adverse to fire in the Oakland Berkeley Hills, so I don't think anything's going to be done about that, but it's a concern. Thanks, everyone.